assure you. If you have your copy of God's Word, if you would, turn to the book of Luke, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 5. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 5. We were in this passage last week. If you survey this passage along with Luke, chapter 4, you find out that Jesus is inter- intervening and Jesus' power is being many different ways. His authority is being revealed in so many different ways. If you see over in chapter 4, the very last part of chapter 4, there was a healing experience that was going on where he was also casting out demons. Then last week we saw in chapter 5 where the, he called his first disciples and they couldn't catch any fish and all Jesus had to do is tell the fish get in the net and there was more fish than they could handle. After that, he, it tells us that he uh, is encountered by a leper who has an incurable disease but says, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me whole And Jesus reaches out and touches him, and he is healed. That brings us to Luke chapter 5, verse 17, where another experience is going to happen, where he is going to heal somebody, but he is going to do beyond and well beyond just the healing of that person physically. In order to start that, before we read the passage, though, I want to ask you this question. Of all the miracles that Jesus performed or things that he did or said, what is the greatest display of his power and authority? Think about that. Of all the things that's recorded that Jesus did, the miracles that he performed, what he said, what would you consider the greatest of all of those miracles? Could it be the calming of the sea? I mean, his disciples were amazed that he calmed the sea. Even nature has to submit to his lordship. What about the feeding of 5,000? Few fish, few loaves, feed 5,000, got more than enough left over. Consider that a great miracle. What about the casting out of demons when the Gadarean ammoniac has no control over heaven? Jesus come and cast it out into the swine. The swine go and drown themselves, and that man is set free and goes home to his family. Could that be the greatest display of power and authority? What about the healing of the blind? Or the healing of the lame. That one who cannot see now sees. The one who cannot walk now walks. Or what about the raising of Lazarus from the dead? A man who's been dead for four days. They said even he begins to smell. And he calls this one Lazarus out from the grave. And he comes forth alive again. All those are great power and authority of Jesus. Amen. They reveal that he is the son of God. He can do things that no one else does. But today I want you to think about a miracle that all of us, if you are a child of God, a miracle that all of us have experienced, okay? If you're a child of God today, all of us have experienced this miracle, and I dare say it's one of the greatest miracles that Jesus ever performs. What are we talking about? We're talking about Jesus' greatest display of power and authority is when He forgives sin. When he forgives sin. If you're a child of God today, your sins have been forgiven. If you have a home in heaven, your sins have been forgiven. And a great display of the authority and power of Jesus is in the forgiveness of sins. I want to show you that in this passage here, all right? Beginning in Luke Chapter 5, verse 17. Jesus is in his home base city, which would have been Capernaum, there by the Sea of Galilee. And he is gathered there, and he is healing people when this takes place. Look at verse 17. And it came about one day that he was teaching. And there were some Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting there who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was present for him to perform healing. Okay, get get this in your mind. He's in Capernaum. The power of God is there. He's healing people. And Pharisees, those religious leaders and scribes, have gathered there from, from Galilee, from Judea, from Jerusalem. They've all come there. Now, they come there to see what this man is doing and who he is. They they feel they have a responsibility to protect the Jewish people from false teachers. So they're coming to see what this new rabbi is teaching, who's Jesus of Nazareth. And it says in verse 18, 
And behold, some men were carrying on a bed a man who was paralyzed, and they were trying to bring him in and to set him down in front of Jesus. And not finding any way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and let him down through the tiles with his stretcher right in the center in front of Jesus. Underline this verse, verse 20. And seeing their faith, he said, Friend, your sins are forgiven you. That statement right there is one of the most powerful statements in all of the Word of God. It's one of the most significant statements in all of the New Testament. That phrase that Jesus said, listen to what he said. Friend, your sins are forgiven you. Look what happens next. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this man who speaks blasphemies? Underline this phrase now. It's very important. He says, Who can forgive sins but God alone? Hear that question? A good question. Good statement. Who can forgive sins but God alone? But Jesus, aware of their reasoning, answered and said to them, Why are you reasoning in your hearts? Here's his question. What is easier What is easier to say, your sins have been forgiven you, or to say, rise and walk? Listen now what he says. But in order that you may know that the Son of Man, he's the Son of Man, has authority on the earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, take up your stretcher, and go home. And at once he rose up before them, took up what he had been lying on, and went home, glorifying God. And they were all seized with astonishment and began glorifying God. And they were filled with fear, saying, We have remarkable, we have seen remarkable things today. That passage there, familiar to most of us, if you've studied the Scripture, about the four friends taking the paralytic, opening up the roof of the house, dropping him down in there, and Jesus heals him, and he walks away carrying his bed. Almost all of us, if you've read very much of the New Testament or the Gospels of the life of Jesus, you've heard that story. But one of the things that's significant is that the most important statement that is made is sometimes overlooked. It's emphasized that he, was, he couldn't walk, his friends brought him, they let him down, Jesus healed him, and he carries his bed away. And what a great miracle, and we'd all applaud and we'd clap and say, isn't that great what Jesus did? But the most significant statement that is made is something that's neglected. And that is whenever that man is being let down, and the first thing that Jesus says, not the last thing, The first thing he says to that man is, my friend, your sins are forgiven you. Your sins are forgiven you. Whenever he made that statement, the Pharisees and the scribes, those keepers of the law, they were offended. They were offended. And they said, this man has committed blasphemy. For only God can forgive sins. Only God can forgive sins. Do you you notice in the Scripture, Jesus doesn't refute that? That is a true statement. You need to write that down in your notes. Only God can forgive sins. Jesus never, ever refuted that. Not at all. Not at all. He, he, he simply says, which is easier? Which, which is easier? Is it easier to say, your sins are forgiven? Or to say, rise up and take your bed and walk away. Be healed. And then he goes on and says, but listen. In order that you might know the Son of Man, him, 
has authority and power to forgive sins. I say to this man, take up your bed and walk. And the man gets up and he walks away, carrying his bed. Revealing that Jesus not only has the authority to heal him physically, but Jesus as the Son of Man has the authority to forgive sins. To Now, what, is, what does that mean, to forgive sins? Well, Brother Roger Wilmore, he preached a couple of weeks ago when I was out. and He had an excellent message. I don't know if you were here that Sunday, but he had an excellent message. And one of the things that he defined, one of the words he defined was the word forgiven. You remember that? He defined the word forgiven. The word forgiven means to send away. All right? To send away. Matter of fact, he goes on and he, he described that it says that God will cast our sins in the sea of forgetfulness to remember our sins no more, that he will cast them as far as the east is from the west, and that's infinity away from us. He has the authority and the power to send away, forgive our sins because he is God, and only God can forgive sins. Now, wait a minute. You say, well, wait a minute. I, I, can, I forgive people. I have forgiven people of what they've done to me. Oh, yes, you forgive people of an offense that they did towards you. And you have the right, and you should do it, forgive people when they offend you. But you do not have the authority or the power to be able to forgive someone of all of their sins. The only one who can forgive of all of their sins is God. Is God. He is the forgiver of sin. He's the one who has the ability to cast away your sin. It literally means to take all the sin of your life, all that sin in your life, and to throw it away, to remove it away from you, and to make you acceptable, and make you clean, to make you righteous, to make you a part of His family, because you've got to be righteous and holy to be a part of His family. The only hope is that he will cast it away. And, and how could he do it? Because he has all authority. Whatever he says to do, it happens. It happens. And when he says, you are forgiven, it happens. So think about it. This man is being let down. And the first thing Jesus says to him is, friend, your sins are forgiven you. Oh, yes, the Pharisees and scribes are offended by that, and they make that statement, only God can forgive sins. And Jesus does not refute that. That is a true statement they made. But what he says next is this. If that is what you said is true, that only God can forgive sin, then let me reveal to you that I am in that position of being God. I'm the Son of God, the Son of Man. And I have the authority, I have the authority to forgive sins. This man sins, your sin, any sins, I have that authority. And, and I want to reveal that authority that I have. I, I want to show you the power that, that I have. And he says, what's easier? In your mind, well, what's easier? Is it, is it easier to say, I forgive you of sins, or is it easier to say, take up your bed and walk? What do you think they thought? I, I mean, in, in their faith, there had been forgiveness of sin, and people say forgiving sins, and all, all through their Jewish practices and altar sacrifices, there had been forgiveness of sin, and people would say those things. How many, how many of them had seen miracles? 
I mean, when Jesus shows up, he turned his world upside down because the lame people are walking, the blind people are seeing, the deaf people are hearing, the dead are coming to life. Who can do that? Why were they all gathered there watching? Because he was healing people. He was doing the miraculous. And so in their minds, they're thinking, hold on a second. Is it easier to say, I forgive you of all your sins, or to say, take up your bed and walk in their minds? It was easier to say, forgive sin, than to say, rise and take up your bed and walk. That's not really true. I'll show you that in just a second. It's not really true. It takes greater power and authority to forgive sin than it does to do a miracle. Like taking up your bed and walking. But for them, they'd never seen that. So in their minds, they thought to do miracles would be the hardest thing. It would be the revealing of the greatest of power. And Jesus knows, he says, he knows what they're reasoning in their mind. And that's why he says, but to show you that I have the authority to forgive sin. I say to you, friend, take up your bed and walk. And the power of God leaves Jesus and goes into that man. And that man who had never had been paralyzed and unable to walk, now all of a sudden has strength in his legs and balance in his stance and is able to pick up his stretcher and walk out of it. And everybody sees the miracle and everybody knows that the power of God has been revealed. But he said, wait, he, he, he said, I want you to see that I have the power and authority to forgive sins. Because you know what? The forgiving of sins is more important than the healing of lame legs and limbs. See, in the economy of God, healing someone of a physical infirmity is no problem. That's really no problem. You know all he has to do? Speak a word. A withered hand becomes straight. A weak leg becomes strong. Blinded eyes. All God has to do is speak. And miracles, physical miracles take place. He doesn't have to ask anybody. Have to call anybody. Don't have to have a committee meeting. Nobody. Nothing. All he has to do is speak it. Now that's pretty easy for God, isn't it? It's not easy for you and me, but if you're God, and all you have to do is speak, and it happens, that's pretty easy. And what Jesus is saying, what, what is easier, to forgive sins or, or, to, or, 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 or to heal a body and to have them stand up and walk? Where you think that is hard and that is difficult, all I have to do is speak it, and it happens. But do you know what the difficult thing is? You know what the hardest thing is? The hardest thing, having to reveal the awesome power and authority of God, is to forgive sins. That's the real challenge. That, that's the real power of God. Now, you, you might say, why, why is that so? I mean, why, why, is, it, why is it so different? Why, why is it greater power to forgive sins than to heal a physical body because of who God is. I want to put something up on the, on the board for you, all right? I want you to see God. I want you to understand about the character and the nature of God and why forgiveness of sin is so challenging and reveals the power of God. First thing about God is God is all sovereign. God, all sovereign means he has power. He doesn't have to ask anybody anything right? He can do whatever he wants to do. There's no, he's God, and he is all sovereign, all powerful. There's no question about that. But when you read the Word of God, God reveals things about his character, and some of those things about his character are in conflict with each other when it comes to the forgiveness of sin and what has to happen, all right? Let me show you what I mean. The first thing I want you to see about God is that God is a God of love, amen? Aren't you glad God's a God of love? Let me say that again for you so you can say amen when you're supposed to. All right. Aren't you glad God is a God of love? If he weren't a God of love, whenever the first man sinned, it would have been over. You would have never had breath in your body. Okay? 
But God is a God of love. And therefore, he wants to show kindness. He wants to show favor. He wants to do good things. He wants to forgive and make right even though we mess up. God is a God of love. All right? Let me go to the next thing. God is a God of mercy. A mercy. Now, mercy is God not doing to us what we deserve. Right? What we deserve because we've sinned is we deserve punishment. We deserve death. We deserve the punishment of death called hell. And that's, that's because the law said it. The law says every soul that sins must surely die. That's the law of God. The law of God. Every soul that sins must surely die. But God doesn't want us to die. He doesn't want us to be separated. And he wants to show us mercy. He wants to show us mercy. So the God who's all sovereign, do whatever he wants to do, he loves us, wants to show us mercy. But there's something else about the character of God. What is that? God is a God of justice. In other words, God can't just turn his back on sin. He can't just say, well, it doesn't exist. A God of justice says that sin must be paid for, all right? Something must be done to make it right. There must be the redemption of it. And that's the character of God. What binds God is not you and me. What binds God is his character. And so even though God is loving and is full of mercy and wants to show us mercy, he's a God of justice, which means sin has to be paid for. There has to be a payment. If it says the penalty of sin is death, death has got to be paid. You understand that? He's not only a God of justice, he's a God of righteousness, all right? A God of righteousness. God only dwells where there is righteousness. In other words, you and I have no hope of dwelling with God, living with God, being with God, if we have unrighteousness, our sin, in our lives. We've got to be made righteous to be acceptable to God and to be in favor with God and to live eternally with God. Amen? You understand that? So look what you've got here. You've got an all-sovereign God who can do whatever he wants to do, but he's only, only restricted by his very character. His character says that I love and I want to show mercy to these people even though they have sinned. But, wait a minute, the problem is that that sin that they committed has got to be paid for. And when it's paid for, they can become righteous. But if they don't become righteous and their sins are not forgiven, there's no hope of living with me and living eternally. So what's going to happen? Now stop right there a second. Go back to what Jesus said when he asked the question. What is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven or take up your bed and walk? Well, you see that. It's, e it's easier for Jesus to say take up your bed and walk. And there's nothing about the character of that person, nothing in conflict with his character. All he has to do is change a withered hand to a, a working hand. All, all he has to do is just speak it and it happens. It, it's the effect of sin that caused that and he can reverse the effect of sin. It's nothing for him to heal somebody. But wait a minute. For him to say, your sins are forgiven based on based on all of these things that make up his character. Something's got to be done. Something's got to happen in order for sins to be forgiven. He can't just say, I don't, you're, you're, you have sin no more. No, nope, can't do that. He's a just God. He's a righteous God. He can't say that. So what has to happen? This is what has to happen. Your sins are forgiven because he becomes a substitutionary God. You know what that means? That means that somebody has to pay the price of sin. In order for him to forgive somebody, somebody has to pay the price of sin. And who is it that's going to pay the price of sin? He does. Now think about it just a minute. Here's Jesus at the early, this is early in his ministry, all right? Early in his ministry. And they come and they say, only God can forgive sins. And he says, you're exactly right. Only God can forgive sins, but I can forgive them. Because why? Because I'm God. Early in his ministry, he's already revealing that he is God. That he is God. 
And, and then he asked that question, which is easier, to say, I forgive you, or to say, take up your bed and walk? He, he's saying, it's not going to be an easy task to be able to offer forgiveness of sin to you. To this man or to you. Because in order for forgiveness of sin to take place, somebody's got to pay the price. And who is the somebody that's qualified and willing to pay the price? The substitutionary God. Who says, I'm coming to pay the price so you can be forgiven. Now, Jesus hasn't died on the cross yet. He hasn't paid the price for sin yet. But he will. He hasn't been resurrected, but he will be. You know what he's saying to that? You know what he said to that man? I'm forgiving you of your sins. And I'm going to be paying the price whereby that forgiveness happens to you. I'm going to pay the price so that I and my authority can send that sin away from you. Never to be in you anymore. Never, never to be responsible anymore. You don't have to be. Because why? Because I'm going to take your place. And he lives his life and he lives his ministry and he does all of those things. And eventually one day they nail him to a cross, not because he had ever done anything wrong, but he was nailed to a cross because he needed to pay the price for those that he would forgive. And see, when he forgave that man's sin there, it would be about two and a half to three years later that he's going to hang on that cross. But when he hung on that cross, he paid that man's sin so that that man could be forgiven. And whenever you ask Jesus to forgive you of your sin, Jesus can forgive your sin because he paid the price on that cross. And because he paid the price on that cross, he can love you with all of his love. He can show you the mercy he wants to show you. And he's still a God of justice because sin was paid for. And he's made you righteous so you're acceptable. All because he took your place. And you know what it requires? You know what it requires? It requires that you believe that he took your place. That you believe that he is the son of man, that he is the son of God, that he is the one who is God, the forgiver of sin. Because notice in this story, how, how, did this man, how, how did this man become a recipient of the forgiveness of God? Listen to what it says in verse 20. And seeing their, what does it say in your Bible? And seeing their what? Their faith. And seeing their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. How, how, how did that man's sin get forgiven? Because of his faith? Because of the faith of his friends? Because what, what did they have? What kind of faith? They had? they had the kind of faith that said, this man is God. This man can forgive. This man can heal. I'm going to go and find this man. And that faith brought them to Jesus, and that faith is how he had forgiveness of his sin. Let me ask you a question. Do you know how your sins are forgiven? He did everything to forgive them. But do you know how you are a recipient of that? By faith. By faith. You believe he's God. You believe he's the son of God. You believe he lived among us, that he died on the cross. You believe when he died on that cross, he took your place and paid your price. And you believe your only hope is through him. And by faith, you say, please forgive me of my sin. I know it's one of the most challenging things to have that. It's going to cost you the most of anything. It's going to cost you and did your life. But thank you. Because in doing that, you forgive my sins. The writer of Hebrews, I want to read just a couple of passages. I'll give those to you. But the writer of Hebrews tells us very clearly what Jesus did for this man and for us. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28, it says, So Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, shall appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly await him. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 12, it says, But Jesus, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God. 
chapter 10, verse 14, it says, For by one offering, Jesus has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. Did you hear that? Listen to that. For by one offering, his offering, his sacrifice, he perfected, what? For all times, those who are sanctified, those who've had their sins sent away. You are sanctified for how long? For all time. Well, you ought to look at somebody and say, you know, I'm sanctified for all time. Turn around. You need to tell somebody that. I am sanctified for all time. Now, they're going to look at you and say, you don't look like it. You, you don't always act like it. That might be true. But you know what it says? When he died on the cross and took our place and we believed in him, we've been made right all time. That sin has been cast away. In Colossians chapter 2, it says this, verse 13. Listen. And when you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven all our transgressions. Having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us and which are hostile to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. You know, I, I, wish, I wish the Lord would just transport that paralytic right here today. I wish, he'd, I wish God would just beam him right down here with us. Just a second. We could have a word of testimony. I, wouldn't you like that? You know what I'd like to ask him? I'd like to say, now let me tell you something. I, I, we read about that picking up your bed and walking. You couldn't walk all that time, and God, God did that for you. We've heard that, and that's, that's amazing. Tell us about that. But, but you know what? We also heard that Jesus forgave you of all your sins. Could I ask you a question? Which one of those things is the most important thing? Which one of those things is the most important thing that happened in your life? And I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt, he would say, I walked many, many days, carried many, many stretchers, but you know what? I finally died. But when he forgave me of my sin, that settled my eternal destiny. And I live forevermore. Because of those words, friend, I forgive you of all your sins. Have you heard him say that to you? Have you, have you felt that authority and power of Almighty God in Jesus whenever you by faith believed in him and he sent your sin away? Have you experienced the peace of God? Because sin has been sent far from you, never to return. Because he sanctified you forever. That old crippled man, without a shadow of a doubt, would say, if you've got to make a choice, make a choice for eternal life, for forgiveness of sin, over having legs to walk. Because that's what lasts forever. Have you experienced that? If not, you need to. And you can, if you by faith will believe that he's the son of God who died on the cross as your substitute so that you could experience the grace and forgiveness of God. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you that Jesus is all we need <laughs> and he's done all that is needed to be done for us to be saved. I pray for any person, Lord, who's in this congregation right now who has never given their heart to Jesus, never asked Him to forgive them of sin, never put their faith and trust in Him that He's the Son of God who has that authority and power, that today would be the day they'd say yes to Jesus. Today would be the day they'd walk down and say, I want to just know Him as Lord and Savior. and Give me an opportunity to pray with Him. Let that today be the day for salvation.